This old neighborhood of San Francisco hardly looks controversial with little here to stir a national controversy. But in recent weeks, influential news media have devoted reams of copy to Haight-Ashbury, lately with stories of runaway youngsters swept up in a bizarre world of drugs, sex, and sloth. But the bulk of the material deals with a mass of bearded, beaded, barefoot people may be causing a threat to normality. Such reports have contributed more notoriety than knowledge. That was fine, so long as the hippies of Haight-Ashbury remained a close-knit group. But their radical customs are spreading fast, demanding serious study. KPIX Reports examines why this society exists and where it hopes to go. Poet Allen Ginsberg calls this beaded, bearded generation the Seekers, youth looking for a better world than their elders know. There seems to be no hurry to the search. Haight-Ashbury offers many passageways for exploration, some false, some dangerous, some promising. However, who but youth has time to wander such a maze, or better chance to make use of any wisdom gained in the search? Some call Haight-Ashbury another Bohemia, like the Left Bank, Greenwich Village, and others of earlier years. But it's more like Brigadoon, a magical land that appeared only yesterday and may be gone tomorrow. But if it lasts, the effect on the rest of society could be far-reaching. That's why the outside world must try to understand what is happening here. Haight-Ashbury cannot be judged from afar, as many have tried to do. Observers must go into the maze and see Haight-Ashbury as only those who live here know it. Michael McClure, a poet playwright with a wide following among the avant-garde and a respected standing among literary critics around the world, is a resident of Haight-Ashbury and was years before it changed character. He welcomes the new scene he sees around him. In his eyes, Haight-Ashbury is more a neighborhood than ever. The places he sees and visits daily mean more to him than the outsider would suspect. One of his first stops is usually the psychedelic bookshop, the hub of Haight-Ashbury. This is a psychedelic shop full of books and records. This is what started January 1st, 1966 in the new rock and roll Montparnasse Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco. This was the beginning of the beaded, velvet, long-haired, leather eternity. It's an important point that LSD was not illegal in California until December of 1966. Before that time, the psychedelic bookshop could openly and avowedly be a center for, legally, openly and avowedly be a center for the distribution of information about psychedelic drugs, uh, psychedelic chemicals, psychedelic experimenting, and psychedelic art and psychedelic literature. At this point, uh, it can still openly do so, and that is the function of it. it. It is the center of a psychedelic community. There's a difference between the beat generation and what's going on now in that the beat generation was uh, in revolt against the middle class that it came from. This new thing that's happening has divorced it all from the generation it came from, has absolutely divorced itself. So that if you make a comparison between what's happening down here in Grant Avenue of 10 years ago, uh, rudimentarily and at the, at the very root of it, it's a different shot. It's a different kind of thing that's going on. When Hate Street was just Hate Street before the, before the people got here, it was like tolerant, interesting, 
pleasant neighborhood. It's become rather beautiful now. The neighborhood is much better to live in now. When I first moved into the neighborhood, there was uh, a certain amount of narcotics in the neighborhood. There was a certain amount of prostitution in the neighborhood, and I don't see any of that now. The young people have come in, they've taken over the neighborhood, and they've really cleaned it up. But I think it was the integration and, and the freedom of the integration and the tolerance, that is, between the, the Russians, the Negroes, the Ukrainians, the older people that lived here, made a kind of tolerance for the long-haired uh, young people as they came in. They weren't stared at, they weren't laughed at, they weren't mimicked, and they dug it. So they stayed here, and then more of their friends came in, and it was just a natural place to go. Across the street from the psychedelic bookshop is the print mint, and inside, the co-op job center. One serves the hippie's mind, the other his stomach. Here it's a community within itself, so work uh, is like a realistic necessity in many cases. I don't think people work unless they have to, uh, whether they have to like for psychological reasons to keep their head straight or whether they have to for financial reasons to uh, keep their body fit. But work is, work is like realistic, and within a community, uh, work becomes a realistic item and work is necessary for most people. So something like the Hip Job Corps is there and serving a real function. Hip Job Corps, hip standing for Haight-Ashbury independent proprietors and getting jobs for these strange looking people who otherwise might have a bit of a time getting a job now. In a sense, the print mint is is still often and like an art gallery because you're going to see where the visual moment at that time but one where you can go in and buy a piece of art for a dollar or two dollars and take it home and put it on your wall you don't think about framing it it's more like hanging a scroll on your wall you put it in with thumbtacks you don't put it behind a piece of glass you might not want to look at it six months from now this new psychedelic art and new psychedelic style is so attractive to the young as most of them have had psychedelics or they've been with somebody who had and they've gotten a contact high and they're thrilled by color and they're thrilled by the like the freedom of their freedom from their own brains that allows them to like to dance not freedom from their intelligence but freedom from like the standard channelings of their of their thinking so that they can move so that they can see one bright color that well, the same way you look at wildflowers in a field and there's a green one next to a purple one, next to a blue one, next to a white one, next to a red one, and it's beautiful. to dig in these old faces and these old personalities represented is is the difference in their humanity from person to person and like the basic similarity of being a human being but the the ability to smile in a different way like the potentiality of having the penetrating gaze and intellect of a Karl Marx as opposed to like the joyous uh, activity like mad nutty playing the harp of Harpo Marx in an Indian movie and to be able to hold all of these positions at once is again like being the window at Chartres. It's not the negative quality of picking out one person to idolize because it's camp and slightly perverse, but the ability to look at all of these human beings and to sympathize and be able to take within yourself the qualities of all of them to make a pastiche or a collage or an assemblage out of a wall, which is like which is like doing the same thing inside of your own brain and your own body. To say, I can smile like Harpo Marx and I can laugh like Karl Marx, or vice versa. Or within myself being a man, I have the ability to grow my hair to my shoulders and understand what it was to be able to think like Greta Garbo without being ashamed and listening to society's pliers telling me I've got to be absolutely this. 
Generally, the hippies of Haight-Ashbury are not political activists like their bearded brethren in Berkeley. They may share many beliefs, but political picketing and speech-making aren't popular in Haight-Ashbury. To many, politics is another tension to avoid. There's been like a new vitality brought into the neighborhood and a changeover. And you'll even go in some places and find merchants who begin to maybe wear a string of beads around their neck, who were here before, who've been turned on by it. And there's been a gradual affection and simpatico that's grown for the uh, rock and roll people, for the hippie people. It's definitely on their side now. The straight theater is the only thing like it that I know of. There are big auditoriums set up for electronic music in Europe. Uh, there are theaters set up for theatrical productions in America. But this is the only theater where the philosophy behind it has been to make a protean, uh, a shapeless theater capable of assuming all shapes. The capabilities of everything happening here are really fantastic. The, the new music is really instantaneous. That's what's so beautiful about it, whether it's like the Quicksilver Mets, it's instantaneous, and it doesn't matter whether this is like an immortal art form or whether this is like the athletic, the beginning athletics for a new generation. t is being dug by the teeny boppers, the Grateful Dead making their kind of huge roar rock, or whether it's some new group like the New Salvation Army group playing right now. Uh, in how to think and dance with the music bouncing against their chakra and nerve centers. Already, rock and roll is like the assemblage movement. It's just like a spiritual instant. I think it's going to grow or it's going to be over or it doesn't make any difference because I see like a new kind of music, a new kind of art coming out of it already. Today my play, The Beard, is being rehearsed here. Billy Dixon is playing the part of Gene Harlow, and Richard Bright is playing the part of Billy the Kid. The play is a kind of a, a rite. It wouldn't matter too much whether the players were Christ and Magdalene or Mars and Venus together. It's a rite. It's a, my imagination being enacted with their meat and their beauty on a shelf, in a sense, with lights being played on them. And, like, she's Gene Harlow and he's Billy the Kid. And they're together in eternity, and it's a kind of blue velvet eternity. You think everybody has to watch? How should I? What do you think? Sure. I don't. Don't what? I think better, boss. Yeah? Stay a good long distance away from me. Why not? Well... Maybe they are. Or what? They're on. Maybe they're bad and don't know it. Life exists on several levels in the Haight-Ashbury. For many, the glamour is more pretense than reality. To some, the search for a psychedelic euphoria wrecks the mind instead of freeing it. The refugee from failure in the outside world may fail here, too. Sex can be beautiful, but with too many, too often it can turn sour. But for people like Michael McClure and friends like painter Mike Bowen, the leaders of Haight-Ashbury, life can be pleasant and entertaining. Mike Bowen has sort of become the Mr. Haight-Ashbury district. Uh, he's put himself in the middle of it. Uh, when I first knew him, he was painting abstract expressionist paintings. Uh, he, he leaves these things behind him, he makes a new self. He comes up with what he is. You see his painting and like there's, a, there's like a painting of Christ with like snakes and skulls and Buddhas spiraled around it. Then you see the process that he's undergoing, what's happening within his own feeling. And, he, and like he brings it there and he puts it in paint. What a man is hungry for, what a woman desires anywhere in the world is what has always been inherent in human nature, which is the desire for, for calmness and for quiet to come into the ear, for the sensation of textures of cloth or 
flashes of color from a surface or a glittering object swinging in space with incense burning on it, making clouds of smoke in the air. When you come to the conclusion that there's uh, nothing but meat and meat is spirit and like the human meat and the human flesh is reality, then you end up in rooms like this speaking about it. Uh, you, you begin to think about where you're at. Uh, you take space and time for a new thought. You put a song by a poet on the record player. You listen. Uh, you discuss. Sometimes the discussions are mundane. Sometimes they're beautiful. Uh, you have to figure well out where you're at. Uh, you put your hand against a new surface. You look at a new smile. You look at somebody's face. Somebody comes into the room. The telephone rings. It's just like it is anywhere else, except here, like the ordinary daily realities that are unromantic are like shed from it and shaved off. You begin you begin to like hear and speak and listen. It's like anybody's front room, except a lot of the a lot of the dead, phony rituals are over and some new rituals are being given birth to which will be replaced by other rituals. I think that uh, he means just generally drop out of living life at second hand and drop into living life at first hand. I think that the 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 dropouts <coughs> in Haight Ashbury um, are dropping into a new society. Uh, this means creating a new society. Uh, it means that it's got to be done by trial and error, and there are some errors, and there are some trials, but there's a great deal of success as well. I think that we are uh, revolutionaries of living because we have actually uh, started dropping into um, a way of living that is relevant, I think, to society as a whole. These people are going back to making bread, they're going back to discovering the mystics, which have always been a part of human tradition. They're going back to berry picking. They're living by candlelight. They want like the touch of body against body. They want the they want the the natural hair. They want the natural clothing. They want luxurious clothing. They want velvet. They want beads. They want ornament to show where they're at and to show that they have, that they have been removed, that they like being removed, that they're going to stay being removed, and that they've set up. They have set up their own way of thinking and feeling, and they're going to live by it. This is a Krishna Kirtan, conducted by Swami A.C. Bhaktivedanta in a storefront near Kizar Stadium. The hour is 7 a.m. The purpose, expanded consciousness without drugs. Mystical oriental religions like this are spreading rapidly in Haight-Ashbury and in part explain much of the introspective nature of the district. The standard Judeo-Christian morals have just blown the coup. They're done for. One of the things that, that these young people are discovering is the quality of being holy. They're interested in in the kirtan, the mantra singing, they're reading the mystics, they're interested in mystic experience. In Haight-Ashbury, doors are for letting people in, not keeping them out. In an apartment like this, the doors swing open often. Here live the Grateful Dead, a popular rock group whose bachelor home life ranges from the bizarre to the beatific. But more often than not, the huge flat pulses to an ordinary beat. The Grateful Dead are roar rockers. They're the rockers that roar, the rock and rolls that blast out sound. Beautiful freak out zap style. There's a real grace inherent within the ability to make in a room a kind of continuous, simultaneous altar of four walls to present paintings and wood and precious objects and stones 
and dripping candles and reflections of light in new ways from new sources on a multiplicity of the awarenesses of what's going on to be able to move as a group from room to room and present yourself in a new situation to conceive of uh, like human pleasure as a dramatic situation to be able to be comic about it to be able to be beautiful about it, to be able to wear a funny hat, to be able to wear your hair to your shoulders, to take like Pigpen for a name and be proud of it, to be able to smile at being called a hippie, to live in a universe of your own creation. Like our uh, dining room has a table in it that has an enormous black crater on the top <laughs> where there was a recent fire. We all walked out of the house leaving all the candles burning. Yeah, yeah. Is that what happened? Mm -hmm. And then the wax caught fire. Yeah, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, the candle burned down to a glass and busted the glass and oh, the yeah. candle fell over. Yeah. yeah, our equipment manager came back to the house before we did. He found the fire burning on the table, called us up, told us about the fire and then split. <laughs> 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 he didn't tell us on the phone that he put it out. <laughs> he was splitting, he was getting out of the house. This is not a fad. This is going back to the 9,000 years of tradition preceding the last 50 years. The last 50 years of mechanization and of Bauhaus architecture and the rigidity of the square blocks of the city and of concrete and steel and girders. The morals of this community are, are not the kind of morals that the police departments attribute to it. Uh, there's a sexual freedom. The idea of sexual restrictions uh, is uh, really passe down there, but it's passe on Madison Avenue and passe on New Montgomery Street, too. It's just that there's not the hypocrisy going on. The straight people really need what's happening here. They need to come in and see. This is an experiment that's not going to come to them. They have to come in here and look at it. The, the creatures in a beautiful experiment with X-ray, crystallography, diffraction, electron microscopy are not going to crawl out and look at you. Like any neighborhood, the Haight-Ashbury district has a seamier side that we've not dwelled upon. There is here, to be sure, a widespread traffic in illegal hallucinatory drugs, many of them placed in the hands of youngsters and others with tragic results. Here also in this neighborhood are persons who are mean, selfish, lazy, decadent. There are also criminals in this neighborhood. There are sexual excesses in this neighborhood. And there is unhappiness in this neighborhood. But are there any more of these things here than in many other parts of the city? Possibly, but probably not. The degree is not important. One does not have to condone everything in Haight-Ashbury to know that it exists. And no harm can come from trying to understand what is happening. Imagine the Haight-Ashbury district as a lion peering through a tambourine with intense, dark, golden eyes, with a cross hanging down from the tambourine, and mushrooms and roses growing below it and a lion peering through the tambourine with intense dark golden eyes and think of it as being an image disappearing, peering, coming back, retracting itself, manifesting itself, being beautiful and it is all perfect, this is really it, and it is all perfect, this is really it, and it is all perfect, this is really it, and it is all perfect, this is really it. And it is all perfect, this is really it. And it is all perfect, this is really it. And it is all perfect, this is really it. And it is all perfect, this is really it.